Acts chapter 13, verse 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep. It's a, it's a lovely little scripture. Now, um, the reason why I want to start there is because we had a little meeting in the week and um, um, it's becoming more and more obvious that Bible-believing churches that tr preach the full counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation um, are, are becoming very susceptible now to being shut down. And it, they can be shut down quite easily. Um, anyway, I, I went home, and I must admit, I, it really, I, I, was a, I was a little bit knocked thinking, this is a, what's happening at the moment? So I decided to, to go onto YouTube and I typed in um, scriptures on hope. Scriptures on hope. And I thought, oh, I'm going to go asleep to all the scriptures to do with hope. So I put the earphones on and at some point I fell asleep. And I woke up in the morning, this was Wednesday morning, to this scripture. Well, it was actually not to this scripture, it was to the song that we used to sing back in the 90s. And the song was, I want to serve the purpose of God in my generation. I want to serve the purpose of God while I am alive. I want to be a part of building something that will last forever. Lord, I delight. I delight to do your will. What is on your heart? Tell me what to do. Let me know your will and I will follow you. I want to be a part of something that will last forever. And I went at night, I'd got these, all these scriptures of hope. And I woke up with this hope from nowhere. I woke up with this joy. This kind of proactive joy. And it brought me back to the times in the 90s when we used to sing this song. And it was a fast song. It was quite hard to keep up with the words, actually. But we used to sing it. This is 30 years ago. And I believe people meant it. Now, there wasn't really much challenge to the church in the 90s, if you think about it. You know, if somebody perhaps called you a few names for being a Christian, that's about as far as it went. But I believe most Christians sang with all their heart, what is on your heart? Tell me what to do, Lord. Let me know your will and I will follow you. I want to serve the purpose of God for my generation. And whoever the writer of this song is understands that every generation has its problems. And David's generation had the Philistines, not only the Philistines, but Saul. You know, it's not just the Philistines, Saul. But David served the purpose of God for his generation. Hallelujah. And then he fell asleep. He went to be with the Lord. Glorious. That's glorious. And I don't know about you, I don't feel any different 30 years later. I feel the same. I want to serve the purpose of God for my generation. What is it, Lord, that you want us to communicate today? That's what we need to be doing. Well, it's a lot harder today than it was back in the 1990s. Let's be honest. There's a lot, there's a lot more things aimed and set against the church than there was 30 years ago. But we serve the same God. Amen. Hallelujah. And he's a good God. So we are looking <laughs> at a generation this morning that I know very little about. They're called Generation Alpha. And they were born around about 2010. And this generation finishes, this is how it works, it finishes about 2025. Now, every year more than 2.5 million people are born into this generation. Of course, little Ruth will be one of them. Little Ruth. It's very easy for the older ones to think this world is going to the wall 
and you, you just feel sorry about the generations to come. But you've only got to look at Ruth and realise that every generation is precious to God. And he's got the very best for every generation. And so God has to raise up people with a heart for the gospel. Because this generation will know nothing of the gospel unless we tell them. So 2.5 million are born every week. By 2024, 2 billion, 2 billion people of this generation will come into this world. That's a lot. It's the largest generation in the history of the world. Don't forget, people die as well during that time. They're not just born, they die as well. Now, this is what they say. And when I say they, I don't look at Christian resources for this. Because you've got to be careful looking at Christian resources because they do tend to have a little bit of a bias. Uh, when, it talk, when we're talking about things like this, I look at what, what do the scientists say? What are they saying about the future predictions? And this is what they say. The next 20 years will see the biggest changes of any, any generation in the history of man. The next 20 years will see the biggest changes of any generation in the history of man. And I'll try to explain this morning why that is, okay? So, last week we looked at Generation Z. And we, see, we saw last week all the problems that we have in Generation Z with the LGBTQ and it's just becoming more and more and more a thing. I don't want to name names this morning, but... One of the people in our church has got a granddaughter who knows another girl in school that right now, we're talking about this generation now, has decided that she wants to identify as a cat in school. And her parents have phoned up the school and asked for cat litter to be put in the toilets so that she can fully identify as a cat. So can you see how things have, are going? Can you see what's happening? We go from one thing, everybody thinks it, it can't go, oh yes it can, there's always another level. There's always another level. However, and this is the key for you and I, we've been born into the kingdom for such a time as this. This is our watch. And so, this is it, folks. There's no dress rehearsals now. Either you and I are up for this, or we may as well go and join a social club somewhere. So, please have a look at Genesis chapter 6. Now, Genesis chapter 6 begins with a population explosion. As it was, Jesus said, in the days of Noah. This last generation has the biggest population explosion of all time. And in Genesis chapter 6, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. It begins with a population explosion, okay? So it says in Genesis 6, now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, of all of whom they chose. It starts with the population explosion. And then we see things gathering momentum very, very quickly from there. And of course, God says, my spirit cannot strive, will not strive with man forever. He tells Noah to build an ark. Everybody thinks that's insane. But he does, he faithfully builds the ark and him and his family are saved. Okay. So, we're going into days of the biggest population explosion ever. I was listening to a, a, a professor at Leeds University. Um, that's the one that Abby went to. And he, he starts off this lecture by saying that 50% of all the jobs as we know today will become obsolete within the next 20 years, right? 
That's what he's, this, this is his lecture to the students. About 20 minutes into the lecture, he, um, he said, we have a problem because 50% of all students today feel depressed. Well, I wonder why. You've just told them that 50% of the jobs aren't going to be there. Like, do the math, you're a professor. <laughs> what they're saying is this. If you're young, there are certain careers not to go near, and there are certain careers to go towards. They're saying if you're young, go towards the sciences, go towards innovation or empathy. Because as we go into robotics, and we certainly are going into a, a robotic age, empathy is the one thing that we can offer which for quite some time robots will not be able to offer. So um, either the sciences, innovation or empathy. Okay. So this that we see now is what is known as the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution. And the, the, the foundation, the cornerstone of this industrial revolution is something called quantum computing. Quantum computing is so ridiculously different than normal computing. It's taken me all week to think of how this, to even describe this to you. So I have to describe this to you because the whole message hinges on you understanding the nature of quantum mechanics. Because quantum mechanics and the character of this generation go hand in hand. One explains the other, actually. It's really weird. So how are quantum computers different to classical computers, the computers that you and I have? So this is a classical computer, a smartphone. And on this smartphone, there is a chip. And on that chip, there are one billion transistors. Now, what are transistors? Transistors are simply on or off. That's all they are. So you can, you, everybody can get that. They're just like a door. They're either open or shut. They're like a gate. They're either open or shut. They're positive or negative. They're on or off. They are entirely predictable. And our computer systems have been built upon something, transistors, that are entirely predictable. They are either on or they're off. The electricity either flows through a transistor or it doesn't. It's as simple as that. They are predictable and they are obedient. Okay? Nevertheless, transistors have become stupidly small. One billion of them, and these are man-made, don't forget, fit onto a chip the size of that in your phone. So you can only imagine how small they are, okay? That's a classical computer. Classical computers calculate with these transistors. On or off, naught or one. Does everybody understand that? Simple. Quantum computers calculate with electrons, not transistors. Electrons are 700 million times smaller than a transistor. <laughs> Do you get that? Uh, you can't get it, can you? There's no way of getting that. Can you see why there's going to be such a leap forward in the next 20 years? When they said, this is one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind, boom. We have no idea what a leap it is from classical computers 
that use transistors, of which there are one billion transistors on a chip about that big, they calculate with these transistors, but quantum computers calculate with electrons that are 700 million times smaller than transistors. Now then, that's, that's only the beginning. That's the easy part. Whereas transistors are predictable and obedient, electrons are unpredictable, they are unruly, they are limitless, and the only way of describing them is they are like naughty kids in a classroom. And if you remember the 80s or whenever you were born, when, when the teacher's drawing on the board, all the kids are throwing rubbers at one another and pulling each other's hair and stuff. And the minute the teacher turns around, they go, dee, 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 and pretend that everything's all right. That is how an electron works. An electron is unpredictable, unruly, limitless, and just plain weird. Plain weird. Where is a transistor? It's just naught or one. Brilliant. An electron, now please, you just have to, this is, I'm going to reach a conclusion with this. An electron is in superposition between naught and one with infinite values. So rather than just naught and one, there's an infinite number of values that it can be at any given time, it can be all of those values or none of them. It can be 1% naught, 99% 1. It can be 50% naught, 50% 1. It can be whatever it wants to be and everything in between. So whereas a classical computer calculates with transistors, naught and 1, naught and 1, naught and 1, dead easy. An electron has a superposition between naught and one of everything that is within naught and one. And it's limitless. It's off the, ch the charts. It's off the scale. <coughs> okay. But there's one rule that the quantum world obeys, and we don't understand why nobody does. And that's this. The minute you try to measure the superposition of an electron. In other words, where the heck it is between naught and one. I'm trying to use layman's terms here. Where on earth is it between naught and one? The minute you try to measure that, it collapses back to naught or one. In other words, when the teachers Turn around and drawing on the board, the kids are naughty. When the teacher turns around to look and measure the kids, they all become very obedient and they start to write. We have reached a stage where we know that this rule, that the minute that you try and measure, the superposition of an electron, it collapses into either a naught or a one. We've reached a stage now where we're able to find a cheat code around that in order to use an electron to compute on quantum computers. They can solve stuff that um, would take billions of years for a classical computer to solve. So there's a cold war on, really, is the bottom line, on who can get one of these working as quick as possible because China has been busy trying to hack various nations. If you, the first person to get one of these up and working, can literally hack a nation. 
because that's what quantum computers do. They can solve any riddle, any enigma, any um, security device that you have on your laptop, they'll see through everything, every transaction, there's nothing hidden. They work it out like that, less than that, because they're in superposition. They don't just look at one route, they see every route simultaneously and they crack the code. You see? The good news is, is that this kind of technology could, could bring about a cure to cancer in no time whatsoever. And so there's a lot of benefits to this. There's advantages, there's disadvantages. But what we're actually meddling with, with quantum computers, is something that we honestly, we don't understand. But this is the bedrock of the fourth industrial revolution that we're going into. Something that we don't really understand. Okay? So, let's just keep this into perspective. You can fit a billion transistors on a chip today, and they are tiny. Electrons are 700 million times smaller than a transistor. You begin to understand the power that these things will be able to harness at some point. Okay, that's the technical part done. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> so here's the thing. This is another quote from these guys. Our bodies will be so high-tech, we will not be able to distinguish between what is natural and what is artificial in the days to come. You and I, if we had this tech in us, wouldn't even know whether it was a natural thought or an artificial thought. That's, these are the days that we're going into. Now have a look at uh, Genesis chapter 11 just for a minute. Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel, as I'm sure you know. The Tower of Babel teaches us so many things. It teaches us what people are capable of if they all unify and put their mind to it. Even if they're dead against God. Even if they're dead against God, what they can achieve if they all come together and put their mind to it. So it tells us that there was one language and one speech. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they came to the plain of the land of Shinar. They dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come let us make bricks, thoroughly bake these bricks. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens, limitless. Now, please, church, you've got to start to make the links. I, I can't really make them for you. You've got to make them yourself. Between, with electrons between the naught and the one, there are a limitless amount of variations. They want to get into the heavens. They want to be limitless. And also, let us make a name for ourselves. Well, God... Now, this is the wonderful news. God does not allow it. And I'm convinced that the things which the Antichrist will want to do in the future, there'll come a point where God will say, enough, enough. And unless those days were shortened, and he will shorten them for the elect's sake. It's another kind of way that God comes down to the Tower of Babel in the last days, if you follow me, really. Okay. I want to show you some things, some of which may not happen and some of which will definitely happen. But this is their projected list for the next 25 years, okay? Now, you might think that's a long time. Well, think back to the year 2000, 2001. Does that seem a long time ago? Seems like yesterday to me. Well, that's how far off this projected future is that we're looking at, okay? So the first thing we need to understand is exponential growth because the computer has been growing exponentially. Does everybody get that? Here's a, a lovely illustration. The guy that invented the chessboard presented this, the, the game of chess to the, uh, the emperor of China. He was so impressed with the, the game that he asked the man, what can I give you for this wonderful gift? So the man says, give me one grain of rice a day on each one of the squares, but every day I want you to double the amount of rice. So there is 64 
little checks on a chessboard. So day one would be one. Day two would be two. Day three would be four. Day four would be eight. 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2056, and so on. So the, so the emperor thinks, that's marvellous, is that all he wants? So there he is, you know, he's um, day one, day two, day three. By the time you get to the 64th check on the board, the mound of rice is bigger than Mount Everest. That's how the exponential world works. And that's what's going to happen with quantum computing. And we just don't get it. It starts like this. If it was a graph, it starts like this. It's quite flat. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. But by the time you get to the latter part of the chessboard, it's almost vertical. That's exponential growth. OK. So we began, or we finished rather, looking at the iPhone. The iPhone was the bringing together of three things. The internet, music entertainment, and a phone. All in one device. And when they actually presented that, uh, I've forgotten the guy's name, what's his name? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. When Steve Jobs presented the, the iPhone, he had a pulpit made up like this. Nobody could see it, but actually there was three iPhones. You thought there was one, but they, they just couldn't get the technology working by that point. So he's pulling one out and saying, and this is how the iPod works. Then he's pulling another one out and saying, and this is how the internet works. They couldn't get it working, but they released it anyway. Now we look at that today and we think, wow, it is. To me, to me today, that is still a wow moment, this. What they intend to do is put this obviously shrunk down, under your skin, in your body. That's the next step. And that's why um, the Apple Watch is quite a, a, um, a product, because the Apple Watch interacts with your body, doesn't it? Or these fitness watches or whatever. They tell you your heart rate and this thing and that thing. It's the next step towards machinery interacting with us. The next thing is chip implants. Now, here's the thing. Chip implants are well and truly here. Is everybody <laughs> They are well and truly here. This is not the future. This is yesterday technology. So your dogs have them. People have them for opening and shutting doors. There's lots of people now that have them for uh, buying and selling. They really do. A lot of young people think they're marvellous. And they have these chips put underneath their skin. And they do all sorts of things with them. So... This is important. The technology to bring about a system where people are marked that they can only buy or sell with that thing has already arrived. It's old school. We're, we're already there, okay? But there's something else that I want to show you that we're not quite there yet. But you'll see as we go further into this that we are we are going to get there, or they are going to get there, because whatever they put their mind to, they will achieve. Imagine the difference between iron and steel, you guys that understand. Massive difference between iron and steel. They just keep on pushing the boundaries all the time, in every way, every way. Okay. So the Hadron Collider, which most of you know about now, it's been around for quite some years where they smash tiny particles into one another, exotic particles, because they want to find out what on earth atoms are made of. All of these things are key to how quickly we get to this point, okay? There's something called the Internet of Everything. Has anybody ever heard of the Internet of Everything? The Internet of Everything is when every device in your house pretty much is connected to the Internet. That is most certainly coming. My Uncle Les, this is my claim to fame, I have a claim to fame, it's my Uncle Les. <laughs> my Uncle Les had his device put on the Big Bang Theory. Does anybody know that comedy? Yeah. 
yeah, called X10. And you can go and look at the clip and they're laughing because somebody in China is turning on a light and somebody in America. That was the beginning of the internet of everything. And that's what's coming. So one day you're going to have smart toilets. Yes, you will have a smart toilet. And that smart toilet, without going into grimy detail, <laughs> will measure what you put in it. It will, and it will inform the NHS, let's say, for instance, that you have a, a, a hundred uh, cluster of cancer cells, and it will let them know ten years before a tumour that this needs treating. Okay? So you, you, your toilets are going to become very smart. <laughs> okay? Your fridges will become smart. So you won't, like Mandy's always saying, well, what wish you of and all this because we live in a van and we can't put much in the fridge. Fridges will order the food for you. They'll know what's missing and they'll get on the internet and they will order your food for you. Smart fridges. Self-driving cars. Some of you have already got them. There are cars today that will park themselves. That is definitely coming in the future. Self-driving trains, poor, these poor people. Taxi drivers, there's all, they're going to lose the jobs, all of them. Uh, we'll sit in cars and we'll work in cars. Cars will be a workplace. The way when you're travelling from one place to another, you'll still be working. So, you know. Elon Musk has something called the Hyperloop. It's, it's going to be kind of like a train, but underneath the ground, it, it levitates off the track through electromagnetism, and it's capable of 700 miles an hour. Again, that's, it could easily happen. So it can go at the speed of a plane, but underneath the ground. Nanotechnology in the brain. So nanotechnology in the brain, you might think, no, that's ridiculous. No, hear me out. Transistors today, man-made, they are man-made, they are now only seven atoms long. They're tiny. They're seven atoms long. So if you think that nanotechnology in the brain is, it, we just won't arrive, we will arrive there. That is going to happen. There will be little nanobots going round in our brains. You will be able to have transferable memory in the future. You might say, I don't want transferable memory. I've got enough with, the, with my own memories, thank you very much. It will, you know, when somebody says, I'll give you a piece of my mind, it might be through tech. <laughs> <laughs> the metaverse, which is a pretty much a total disaster. Zuckerberg with his metaverse, some of you have heard of it. He was the third richest man on the planet with Facebook. Then he came up with this ridiculous idea that we're all going to wear these goggles. And uh, he just didn't read the market like Sir Clive Sinclair didn't read the market with the, uh, with the little buggy, electric buggy. Way too... People don't want goggles. But they will, and I know you find this hard to believe, but they will go for a chip. They will go for something that's inside where they can actually just see things within their own brain. So he's actually lost $13.7 billion on the metaverse. That's a lot of money. The brain net. The brain net. Not the internet, but the brain net. So the brain net means that you are connected to the internet simply through your brain. You will not be using remote controls in the future. You will think and the telly will switch on. You'll think and the sound will go down. The graphic equaliser, if you've got one, will go up or down. Or whatever it is you want to do. The brain net is the way it's going to go. Films and games will be full sensory. Now imagine that. Full sensory. Not with cumbersome goggles and, 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 and strange things. They will be full sensory because they're going right into your mind. Now imagine, friends, and uh, you know you don't need me to explain to you where this could go to in terms of films, but it's going to make reality seem extremely boring. If you can get full sensory, what's reality going to be like? Yes. <clears throat> so we're going, to, we're going into a biotech engineering and gene editing. You know all about these things. Digital schools will be the way forward. Digital schools online. The population will go up to about 9.7 billion. Renewable, renewable energy. 
um, AI will begin to surpass the power of the human brain. Now, all of these things may or may not happen depending on the birth pangs in Matthew 24, depending on wars, pandemics, earthquakes, and so on, because they slow things down. They slow technology down. But if, we get, if, if mankind were to get a clear run at this, then by about 2040 to 2045, we'll reach a point that, that the world will... You just won't even recognise the world. So... Uh, there's something called quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement is insane. It, 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 Einstein called it spooky. Where an electron at one end of the universe can be entangled with an, uh, an electron at the other end of the universe and communicate to one another without a signal in between. So you can't interrupt the signal. You can't hack the signal. There is no signal. They're just, it's just a quantum entanglement. And what they believe this will bring about ultimately is a form of teleportation. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Ultimately, quantum co computers, when they reach that point, remember, you can get a thousand, a million, sorry, a billion transistors on a chip. An electron is 700 million times smaller than a transistor. And that's where we're headed. Now, to let you know where we're at, if you can remember what computers were like in the 1950s, that's what quantum computers are like today in terms of where they need to get to. So we're not talking about tomorrow, folks. But when they get there, this, you will not recognise this world. It will be such a giant leap for mankind, you, nobody will be able to recognise it. Okay, so these are things that we know are coming. Centralised digital banking, not decentralised, not Bitcoin, not these things. Totally centralised digital banking globally is coming. A form of the social credit system that we see in China is coming. A centralised world government is coming. A, and the worst one for, for us is a centralised world religion. It's coming, okay? Now, ultimately, when AI and quantum computers get to that point, which they say is around about 2045, 2050, around about that point, they call that the singularity. When computers become way faster, way cleverer than you and I, and that is the point that they believe we can reach immortality where we can cheat death and live forever, okay? Also, you're going to see this. In the Dark Ages, science and religion were one and the same thing. And then through modernism, they kind of went the separate ways. And we said they're two different things completely. In the last days, in the Bible, we see that science and religion, or rather the occult, come back together as one. And you can see that in the Bible. So when we, when we say we break bread until the Lord comes, you know, I'm sure you're the same. Underneath my breath, I'm like, come Lord Jesus. Okay, let's have a look at Revelation 9.11. No, Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Now, I have a theory, this is only a theory, that the top of the Tower of Babel, I'm not talking about a literal Tower of Babel, I'm talking about the singularity now. The top of the Tower of Babel is the bottom of the bottomless pit. That if these people can ever actually break through, the Doors wrote a song in the late 60s, break on through to the other side. That's what happened in the latter 60s, we looked at that, everything changed. If we can actually break through to other dimensions, we're going to find that what we've broken through to is not what they think. Understand that it's called the bottomless pit. It has no bottom. It's limitless. What do they keep on saying about themselves? We are the limitless generation. The boundless generation. We're on a broad road. It has no boundaries. 
How are our electrons different than transistors? They're in superposition. They are limit, there are limitless varieties of what they are between 0 and 1. This quantum computing and these two generations share the same mindset. It's really weird. <laughs> you think, are you going to get to the point? Is there a point to this? Yes, there is a point to this. It goes on to say, to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. He opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. Have a quick, quick look at Genesis 19, Genesis 19, 27. Genesis 19, 27, Sodom and Gomorrah has been destroyed, okay? In verse 27, Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and he saw and behold the smoke of the land went up like a the smoke of a great furnace what do they see when the abyss is opened the smoke of a great furnace what was it that the angels saw that when they saw it they said get your family out we're going to destroy this they saw gang rape gang rape that's what they saw in Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, folks, there's no end to this. It, you don't, they, sin doesn't reach a point and say, enough, thank you, I'm quite happy where I am. That doesn't happen. It's limitless. It's lawlessness. It's a broad way. Okay, now let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Now this is where, hopefully, all this is going to start making sense to you. Our God is very different than the way we deal with things. And how we communicate this over to the generations to come is really important. So let's have a look again. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. They're trying to get rid of the, the fact that God is, is male now. That he's a father. That's the next thing. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and he commanded them to be fruitful. It's just beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. He blesses marriage. Blesses marriage. And he's made it so that we are attracted to one another and it's so good. But I want you to notice this. This is so important. Notice that this male and female is exactly the same as a transistor. It is either one or the other. And there's no in between. Do you understand that? It's either one or the other and there's no in between. One of the, one of the terms that's been knocked about now is I am non Binary. So, male and female is binary. That's what it is, friends. It's binary. And that's the way that our God has made us. Praise the Lord. It's not confusing. You know where you stand with it? It's simple. It's, it, it, it's nothing random about it. It is what it is. It's binary. Male and female. Right? Brilliant. So, one of the things today is, I am non-binary. Well, what does that mean? So I googled it. I, 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 I want to know what they, what they say they mean. What do they mean by non-binary? So what they say they mean by non-binary is, we can be anything between male and female. We can be 1% male, 99% female, 49% male, 50 it doesn't matter. It's limitless. It's in super, superposition. Does everybody understand this? In other words, non-binary is in superposition. It's all of the things in between, whatever you want it to be. That's how a quantum computer works. Anything between 0 and 1 in superposition. It can be anything you want. It's limitless. And so I'm listening to these people saying, we can be anything. We're non-binary. We... But this, this fits the age perfectly. It's incredible how the two 
explain one another. But here's the problem. They've known this since the beginning of the 1900s. It's the most provable experiment in science. If you want to look it up, it's called the double slit experiment. Some people call it Schrodinger's cat. And this is it. Whenever a, an electron is in superposition, remember the teachers are on the chalkboard, the kids have been naughty. The teacher turns around, everybody's good again. Whenever an electron or anything in the quantum world, because it, it goes by different laws, anything in the quantum world is observed, weighed, or measured, it collapses, bang, back to either naught or one. <laughs> Do you understand? So instead of being any of these things in between, when it's been weighed and measured, it collapses back to naught or one. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? God has made us male and female. So we've got this, this culture that says, no, we're anything and everything in between. But God has made us male and female. And in physics, whenever something in the quantum world is weighed and observed and judged, it whatever state it thinks it's in, do you understand? Whatever state it thinks it's in, it collapses back to a naught or a one. An on or an off. Door open, door closed. Electricity flowing, electricity not flowing. Male, female. Okay, that, isn't that incredible? I hope you think that's incredible because that took me an awful lot of time. <laughs> Seriously, a lot of time. <laughs> and I've been doing Mandy's head in all week. Because <laughs> she's like that obedient transistor, you know, that you can, you, you can rely upon. I'm probably like that naughty electron. I hope not, Lord. I really hope not. Now let's have a look at De Deuteronomy 22, a second. Deuteronomy 22, verse 9. This, this now shows us the character of our God. You're going to see this by the time we get to the end of this. Our God sees things very differently than we do. He really does. So in Deuteronomy 22, verse 9, it says, You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed. Okay? Lest the, the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. Okay? You shall not plough with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear a garment of different sorts such as wool and a linen mixed together. Do you see that even in the Old Testament, God hates mixture? Not because he's got a problem with his wearing something with two, but because of the principle. There is a principle. Yeah. So go back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God. So in Genesis chapter 1, you have God and you have the serpent. Notice there's no in between. And God said, let there be light. And so what do you have? You have light and you have darkness. And you see this, this predictable, reliable binary in Genesis, that makes perfect sense. Not 50 shades of grey, <laughs> but light or darkness. Yeah. Light or darkness. Amen. No in between. Yeah. Okay. Have a look at Joel. Joel, chapter 3, verse 14. <laughs> what we we begin to realise with our God, the God of Christianity, <laughs> the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob, the Christians that have been grafted in, the one that created the heavens and the earth, what we begin to realise with our God as we go through the Bible is, we can, I'm talking scientifically first, we cannot be in superposition. We can't be a mixture. We have to make our minds up. So in, jo in Joel chapter 3 verse 14 it says this. Multitudes, multitudes in the 
Not in the valley of superposition, in the valley of decision. Decision. Now then, Revelation chapter 3 verse 15 is Laodicea. Laodicea. You're, you're going to find this everywhere. You're going to start seeing it all over the place. It is said that in Yom Kippur there was three books in the lead up, in the ten days. There's three books because the Feast of Trumpets leads up to Yom Kippur, the most solemn day in the Jewish year, where the high priest would go and present an offering. That in the build up to Yom Kippur, there were three books. There was a book, and they, they have names in. So there was a book for the utterly righteous. There's a book for the utterly wicked, but there's a middle book, and most people's names are in the middle book. And the idea of the Feast of Trumpets is to get your name out of the superposition of the middle book into one of the other two. Do you understand? Okay. Now listen to the words of Jesus. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. What are they? They are a superposition between cold and hot. What does God think about this? The lady I told you about last week that was persecuted for 16 years in Eritrea, all she did is pray a simple prayer. She was a Catholic lady that read the book of Revelation. She read about Laodicea. She cried out to God, Please don't let me be lukewarm, Lord. Please don't let me. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes to stop me from being lukewarm, do it, Lord. And she went from one prison to another. I'm not going to go into the detail for the next 16 years. And that woman is certainly not lukewarm anymore. She's on fire for God. Amen. I know your works that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were one or the other. Because if you're one or the other, I can do something with you. By the way, the actual, the target here from Jesus' perspective is to be hot. When he says, therefore, be zealous, the word means be at boiling point. So the target is to be at boiling point. But he says here, you're neither. And because you're neither, I will spew you out of my mouth. Can you see this? Do you understand what's going on here? God hates this. He hates it so much. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves a very simple question. Are we hot? Are we at boiling point? Or are we in a kind of a superposition between hot and cold? Because no matter where you look, God has a way of viewing you that you don't. So it's like this. I know your works. Remember how it works in quantum mechanics. They can stay in superposition until they have been measured and weighed. When they're measured and weighed, they collapse into one or the other. So Jesus comes to the church of Laodicea and measures them, weighs them. They're in a superposition between hot and cold. And he says, I know your works. I know exactly where you are. And you say, well, Lord, I love you, but I've got this, this, and this in my life. But I do love you, Lord. And he, he says, I've weighed you. And you've collapsed into one state or the other. Do you understand? Let's move on to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 is a unique time in world history. Future world history. There'll never be a time like this. It's totally a unique time where the entire population will collapse out of a superposition into two camps. Worshipping Jesus or worshipping the Antichrist. Before that point, the world was in superposition. 
well, I'm this, I'm that. I identify as a cat. I do this, I do that thing. I'm, you know, fairly righteous, but I've got these habits in my life. I'm this, I'm the other. They're all in between. Multitudes, multitudes between naught and one, between righteousness and wickedness. Multitudes in a superposition in the middle. And God allows the Antichrist for three and a half years to raise the temperature up on the earth to such a degree where God observes them and they collapse into one of two camps. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns were ten crowns, and on his heads were blasphemous names. We covered this when we looked at the book of Revelation. The key to Revelation 13 is blasphemy. Blasphemy. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth was like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if, now this is so important, please. I saw one of his heads as though it had been mortally wounded. That word mortally there means that he was dead. Yes. Dead. It's a death blow, literally. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped. Remember, from the Garden of Eden, he's only ever wanted one thing. It's always the same thing. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who's like the beast? Why are they saying who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Why are they saying that? Because the one that had had a mortal blow, a death blow is still alive. How can that be? How can something that was biologically dead live? Okay, this is why you have to understand the singularity. It's why you have to understand where all these things are going to. They want to cheat death. One of the ultimate things that they want to do, honestly, this is not an exaggeration, this is fact. They want to cheat death. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. And he was granted to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over what? Over every tribe, tongue and nation and all who dwell on the earth. The earth dwellers, those that dwell, the earth is their home will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life, the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. And then comes anyone who has an ear, you, you need to hear this. This is important, what's being said here. Listen very carefully. Anybody who is an earth dweller, who sees this earth as their home, when, the, when they have been weighed, when they have been put in the balances, they will collapse. And when they collapse, they will collapse into the camp of Satan. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience or the hupomone, the staying power of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon and he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence, causing the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. So this is, you have to see this, this is so important. Can you see in Revelation 13, there is a satanic unity. Remember the Tower of Babel? This is a satanic unity. This is a very strong unity. Whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Something that Elijah could do, remember? And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling them, now this is, listen, this is so important. People just, they, they read past this. Telling those who dwell on the earth, earth dwellers, those who, this, this is their home. Telling them, telling them to make an image to the beast. Who makes this image? The world makes this image. They don't make it. The world 
makes it. And if you understand what the word image means in the New Testament, this is not a stone image or a wooden image. It means much more than that. So the word is used in Colossians 1.15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Well, that he is living. It's Jesus. He's living, friends. And he's the image of the invisible God. Or it's used again in 1 Corinthians 15.49. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. They tell the world to build something that isn't just a stone statue. This thing lives. It lives and it can even talk. It has personality. Now do you understand why the push for cloning things and the genetic hacking chips above all, above all quantum computers. Do you understand why all these things are so important? They tell the world to make this. It's the world that makes it. But then it says this. um, Which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast and that the image of the beast could both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, all, both small and great, rich and poor. Most of the world is poor, but he even manages to reach to the poor places, free and slave to receive a mark. That technology is already here, folks. We've got that technology. That technology is old school. But the technology to make a clone of somebody else is still a way off. Do you understand? That's really important. It's still a way off. To receive a mark on the right hand or on the forehead that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there's going to be a collapse. In that that three and a half years, everybody that's in some kind of superposition that believes this or has this or says, well, this is me, this is the way I am, you've got to accept me as I am, they collapse into two camps. They either worship God or they worship the devil. It's exactly how quantum mechanics works. It's bizarre. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate. Calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. One of the things that quantum computers can do better than anything else, if you had a phone book that had a million entries in it, but all the names were taken out, this is an example that a scientist gave. This is not a religious man, this is a scientist. If you had a phone book with a million entries, that all the names were taken out, a conventional computer takes a long time because they have, they have to go through every single variation. With a quantum computer, they can look at the entire thing in one go as a superposition, bang, bang, poof, and they can come up with the name to the number. Do you understand? It says calculate. And there's something coming into our lifetime. There's four or five quantum computers now. IBM has one, Google has one. There's various ones about... They are exponentially getting faster each year. We are entering a stage, folks, that the world has never seen anything like what's coming. But go to Revelation chapter 20. Now we're running out of time. In Revelation chapter 20, this is the important thing. Everybody that has ever lived is brought before the throne. Everybody that has ever lived is brought before the throne. And everybody that has ever lived is pure in their own eyes. That's what it says in Proverbs. We all think we're good enough. Well, you know, I'm 45% bad, but I'm 55% good. Everybody that has ever lived is some kind of a superposition between wickedness and righteousness. Everybody that has ever lived. They're brought to the great white throne and they are weighed by God. They're measured by God and they collapse into two categories. The wicked 
and the righteous. And they are allocated one of two places. Heaven or hell. That's the way it works. That's the way, church, our God sees this. He doesn't see it the way that we see it. Am I getting this across? I really hope so. So let's, in in five minutes, look at the gospel. Shall we? Let's look at the gospel. Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. There's this horrible, proud king that has brought in goblets. He's blaspheming the God of Israel. We don't know what he was doing, but it, it, it wouldn't have been pleasing to God. And suddenly, there's a hand that writes on the wall. And this dismembered hand literally causes this man to collapse. He, his knees bang together and he literally loses control of his bowels. He collapses from this superposition of whatever he identifies himself as to what God sees him as. You, king of Babylon, have been weighed in the balances and found wanted. Whatever you think you are, whatever you identify as, however you have judged yourself, I have observed you, I have weighed you, I have measured you, I have judged you, and this is what you are. God has done that with every person that has ever lived. He can't help it, he's God. That's what he does. Whatever smokescreen we want to put up and say what we are, it doesn't mean anything to God. He knows what we are. That's number one. Number two, John chapter 16, verse 8. John 16, verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. Not only has God weighed us, God loves us so much that he spent the whole, he, he, he sent the Holy Spirit to show us our sin. How unrighteous we are and the fact that judgment is coming. That's how much he loves us that he wants to show us that we are going to collapse. And so there are those that in this lifetime, and I don't know how it works, I just don't know, but there are those that become aware that they really are sinners. They, they, they know that they're sinners. They stop saying, well, I'm 49% pretty good. Maybe 51%, I'm, I'm not good. They stop all that and they realise that God does not see them that way. He sees them in binary. We're either righteous or we're wicked. There is no in between. Do you know that that's the whole purpose of the book of Revelation? Do you know that? The whole purpose of the book of Revelation is to get you as a person to stop thinking this is what you are and to realise Revelation will polarise you into one position or the other. That's the whole point of Revelation. It intentionally polarises you. Okay, so God has weighed us. The Holy Spirit has convicted us, but here's the good news, and it is good news. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. For God demonstrates his love. The first thing you need to know is this, that the God that has weighed you, the Holy Spirit that has convicted you, has sent a son who loves you. He loves you. And he's demonstrated his love towards you in that while we were in a superposition between good and evil, while we were enjoying all of that confusion, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more than having now been justified by what? By his blood. We shall be saved from what? The wrath to come. 
They're off to come. Because when we stand before the throne, we will collapse into one of two states. Righteousness, wickedness, and be allocated either heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. Yes. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. What does that mean, church? Well, it means this, that God has weighed you. The Holy Spirit has convicted you. Jesus has loved you. He's died for you while you were in sin. And now he has redeemed you. What does that word mean? Well, we're all chained together, naked, in the, in the slave market of sin. We're all one. We're just one big person that's inherited the sin of Adam. That's us, every one of us. We've all got the traits of our fathers and mothers, haven't we? And it goes all the way back. We were born in sin, we were shaped in iniquity, and there's not a person in this room that hasn't sinned before God. We are in the slave market of sin, chained together and naked. But he comes and he redeems us. What does it mean? It means he buys us back to himself. And here's the most amazing thing. The, the, the man that buys the slave has to pay the price that the slave is worth. The man that buys the slave has to pay the price that the slave is worth. Do you realise that your price in God's eyes is as valuable as the blood of his own son? That's the price he paid for you. The highest price ever. So we're naked, we're chained together, we are in sin. But the Bible says he's redeemed us, he's justified us, he's redeemed us, and he's forgiven us, but he doesn't finish there, and you've got to give me a couple more minutes and I will finish, I promise you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. So he was utterly righteous and he was made to be utterly sinful. He was utterly righteous and made for us to be utterly sinful. That we might become, through him, the righteousness of God. He's weighed us. The Holy Spirit has convicted us. Jesus has loved us to death. Jesus has justified us legally in heaven by his blood. He's redeemed us legally in heaven by his blood. He's forgiven us legally in heaven by his blood. And he has imputed into us a righteousness. So that when this whole thing is done and everybody comes out of this superposition, you will collapse into righteousness. What will be written on you is the righteousness of the Lord. That's how you'll collapse when all this is done because of the work of the Lord. Now let me finish by saying this because time's pretty much gone. Nobody really understands how quantum mechanics work. Do you know that? Nobody really understands how a plasma screen works. We still use them. Nobody really understands the rudimentaries of electricity at its deepest level. But we'll get in a plane and trust the plane. And it's run off these things. God is not asking you to understand the mechanics of what he's done. He's asking you to trust him. In the same way that you get on a plane. And we don't fully understand electricity, but we'll get on anyway. He's asking you to trust him. To trust that what he did, he really did for you. I want to serve the purpose of God for my generation. I want to serve the purpose of God 
while I am alive. I want to be a part of something that will last forever. Lord, I delight, I delight to do your will. What is on your heart? Tell me what to do. Let me know your way and I will follow you. Church, there are generations that are going to see things that you and I can't even begin to imagine. God raise up young men and young women, older men and older women, that will love them enough to explain the gospel to them in a way that they can understand. Amen. Amen.